Before we get into this video, I would just like to say that at the time I finished my recording, I had only just been made aware of Bandai Namco striking channels that have been putting up mod showcases in Tekken 8. The mods are not banned from the game themselves, but channels that are monetized, that are using mods and making mod videos, they are being hit with some strikes. And that's a bit concerning, but I was not aware of it until after I finished my video. Also, with Mortal Kombat, I'm not going to be talking about any content creators involved with that game or any of the beef they happen to be involved with. So this is all going to be my own personal experience with all three of these games. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Yep, that about sums up my experience of all three of these games. But for anyone who wants to stick around for a more lengthy explanation, kia ora family, today I thought I might take my turn talking about what the FGC has dubbed the Big Three. Those three of course being Tekken 8, Street Fighter 6 and Mortal Kombat 1. And believe me when I say that approaching this subject was a lot more difficult than it may seem. But I'm going to do my best. I figured the best way to do it is look at how each game is presented, what they have on offer, and then finally, I'm going to be comparing my own personal experiences with each one, and then finishing off with my own gripes and nitpicks. So let's start by talking about Tekken 8. Leading up to this game's release, everyone was excited for it, me especially. We were already impressed with its presentation very early on in its first reveal trailer, but everyone was happy that the developers were taking their time to make this not only a great game to play, but a great game to look at. And when it came out... It's me! I'm totally... Ready. The developers let this game simmer and cook and it shows. The presentation, the overall graphics, the art style, everything about it looks fantastic and what you have on offer is even better. This is one of the most feature rich fighting games out there right now, and debatably, it is also the best looking. And that is the most important thing about how this game is being presented. To a lot of casuals getting into this for the first time, they see a very pretty looking fighting game. But for hardcore veterans that have been with this series for a long time, they see it as this game series finally getting the love and attention, and more importantly, the budget it has needed for a very long time. As someone who's been playing this series ever since Tekken 1, and I've been an enjoyer of Tekken 7, despite how lackluster the presentation has been in that game, this makes me very happy. A lot of these changes can also be attributed to the developers abandoning tradition by making this the first ever Tekken game that did not have an arcade release first before the console releases. This game was built with console release in mind first. So that was very surprising and Tekken has often been very shy to stray away from their traditions, but not this time. And the result? A very dramatic yet very welcome change for both veterans and casuals alike to make a very enjoyable game. Chef's Kiss. But don't think for a moment that Street Fighter 6 had been lacking. Oh no. Street Fighter 6 also had a dramatic overhaul with its presentation and what it offers to both casual and hardcore players. In fact, Tekken and Street Fighter team, they are like family. They're like brothers. They communicate with one another all the time about ideas. And people have often joked about that in the past, even around the Street Fighter 4 and Tekken 6 days. With how close that these companies are, it's honestly kind of hilarious. 
But yeah, Street Fighter 6 is no slouch. This game has beautiful presentation, amazing art style, a very good understandable layout with its menu system, everything. Street Fighter 6 is also a well put together package and I have been enjoying this game ever since it came out and I feel like that I myself personally am still within the honeymoon phase of Street Fighter 6. I recently jumped online just so I could get Marisa up to gold rank because that was the promise I made to myself last year when I got DJ and Zangief to gold rank. And now that I've got Marisa to gold rank, mm, lovely very similar to Tekken 8, that's the best thing about Street Fighter 6. It is presented as THE Street Fighter game for both casuals and hardcore players. This game was almost like an apology for how things were in Street Fighter 5. For anyone who doesn't know, that game had a very, very rocky start, to put it politely. And Street Fighter 6 came out the gate swinging from every single angle and every strike connected the way everyone wanted. So Street Fighter 6, once again, another chef's kiss. But now we get to Mortal Kombat 1. At the time of this recording, this game has been out for six months. This game released in September last year, and when people saw that this game was releasing in the same year that its reveal trailer was dropped, that got everybody both excited and very concerned and that's putting it politely everybody saw very early on despite how pretty its graphics looked that this game was rushed and when i mean rushed i mean hella rushed this game has a very simple layout uh even by mortal kombat standards it's a little too simple this isn't the word i want to use but it's the one that best describes it it looks cheap, and that is not a word you want to associate with anything Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat and the word cheap should not be said in the same sentence. Unfortunately, that's how it is. The reasons why for that, well, I'll get into that later. But for now, let's talk about the presentation. Now, with this game running on Unreal Engine 5, very similar to Tekken 8, it of course is very good to look at. There's no doubt about that. Mortal Kombat games have always looked fantastic. And Mortal Kombat 1 is no exception. The lighting, the textures, the particle effects, everything looks amazing. And even though it is expected from a fighting game that gets a lot of its funding from Warner Brothers, it's still very nice to see. It's good to see that Mortal Kombat still keeps pushing to the next level to make their games look as good as they possibly can. And even when you have your game running on an RTX 3050, like mine, it still looks pretty good on medium settings. But when you push the game to its absolute limit, it is very pleasing to the eye. The character models, the textures, the lighting, the stages, all of that is presented really well. Unfortunately, the way the overall game is presented, not so much. Instead of being presented as the next big Mortal Kombat, it honestly feels like that this game has been presented as fulfilling a status quo. When I said this game was hella rushed out, I meant it, and everyone has noticed that. The presentation for as good as it looks, the way it's presented to its audience, both casual and hardcore, it is presented as a product that was rushed and needs a lot of work, and I certainly hope it gets that work very, very quickly. Unfortunately, like I said, this game's been out for six months now, and it's been very slow waiting for the improvements to this game. So in terms of overall presentation, it's fine, but it could definitely be better. But of course, beautiful presentation doesn't really mean jack if the content that's being presented isn't really worth your time. But I'm happy to report that Tekken 8 has a quality smorgasbord of content for both casual and hardcore players. And when I mean a lot, I mean a shitload. Like, I thought that there was already enough content in Tekken 7, though it could have been better. But Tekken 8, as I said before, the budget upgrade is on full display and it shows. From the minor things to the major things. So, of course, one of the biggest glow-ups is the story mode. 
The story mode in this game is a full cinematic experience that Tekken fans have been wanting for a very long time. Now that's not to say they haven't done it before, they have done a story mode with Tekken 7, but that was divided in between still images and the narrator, which many people took issue with. And they have done a cinematic story mode in Tekken 6, but that was an entirely different style altogether, where it was like a 3D Streets of Rage. And the cinematic cutscenes, while they were lengthy, they were very few and far between. But the story mode that we have here in Tekken 8, I've said this, everyone else has said this, it is by far the best fighting game story mode we have on the market. There are so many unique battles and pretty cutscenes, and of course the visual presentation is just immaculate. And outside of that, you've also got a kind of secondary story mode, which is just the classic story cade from Tekken's 4, 5, etc. Where you play through a specific arcade ladder with your set character, and there's little dialogues in between, and you get a cinematic ending. I'm happy those still stuck around, and while they were okay in Tekken 7, I'm happy to see that here in Tekken 8, they are full on cinematic awesomeness and goofiness. And outside of that, you've also got another regular arcade ladder, which is kind of like time attack mode from the previous game, only this time, like Tekken 7, if you manage to clear certain conditions in the arcade mode, it will give you a different boss fight at the end. Which is really cool because Tekken 7 did do the multiple boss fights thing, but there's a lot more of them in this game, and there's even one that returns from Tekken 6 which really caught me off guard. And of course outside of that you've got the third story, which is Arcade Quest. Now this one is a more meta story, and what I mean by that is that it takes place outside the actual Tekken universe and instead takes place in the casual and competitive Tekken scene. So you are a created avatar that just goes around talking to different people from all walks of life who enjoy playing Tekken for different reasons. And I love that. And you can also download the ghosts of other players and even yourself so that you can practice. And that's amazing how we have a cinematic story mode and then you've got the story uh, character episodes which have their own CG cinematic endings on top of that. And then you've got the arcade quest story mode where you tag along with a couple of friends so that you can travel to different arcades around all these different areas and you meet up with different people who all play the game and enjoy it for their own reasons. This is amazing to have in a fighting game because there are different people who will be like, I don't really care about the story, I only like the gameplay. The gameplay is fine but I love the music more. I like doing the wacky customizations, I like getting online to play with friends, that type of stuff is amazing. All these people being gripped by these specific unique things. As someone who's a long time veteran, I'm just gripped by a brand new Tekken. I love trying the new mechanics and stuff that comes with the heat system, I love the returning Tekken ball mode, I love all the different customizations in this game. And outside of all of that, there's Super Ghost Battle, one of the best new additions to any fighting game. And this is actually kinda similar to what Samurai Showdown did, or Samurai Spirits, where you can practice against yourself and your AI will learn all of your tactics so that you can pick up on things that you have bad habits with doing. And you can also download the ghost of friends, other random players around the world, or as you can see on the screen, you can download the ghosts of Katsuhiro Harada as well as Michael Murray and you can download the ghosts of Shimbore who is the former director of Dead or Alive's 5 and 6. This is incredible. You've got all this amazing stuff with this game outside the regular things like model viewer and whatnot and there is so much replayability as well. And speaking of replayability, I do enjoy playing online. I'm not someone who goes online as frequently as other people. I've put 80 or so hours into this game, and I'll be honest, only three of those hours are online. 
The other 77 is me messing around offline enjoying all this game's content. And while there have certainly been issues that people have reported with this game, I haven't personally experienced them myself. More on that later. But right now I'm happy to report that my experience with this game has been nothing short of amazing. This is a very good Tekken game and many people have said, despite its issues, that it is the best modern Tekken that we currently have. And also, I just love the customization, I can't stress that enough. Right now, my favourite customizations in the game are Maxima Jack 8, Android 16 Jack 8, Jack Hanma Jack 8, you can see a pattern here, and of course I made Kazuya look like Yujiro Hanma, Jin like Baki Hanma, and again with Kazuya I made him look like Geese Howard and Omega Rugal from King of Fighters. Oh, and in case this wasn't obvious enough, the Tekken tunes. Tekken Frickin' Tunes. And speaking of drops, let's talk about Street Fighter 6 because holy f me personally, I've always felt that the Street Fighter series has been the best living example of moving forward and trying new things, while also being able to backtrack old ground to further that new stuff. Like how they revisited a lot of Street Fighter 3's urban aesthetic for the new urban aesthetic in Street Fighter 6. And nowhere is that more prominent than with the music. Yeah, there's a lot of classical scores and instrumentation in this game, but rap and hip hop are the main focus, just like Street Fighter 3. And while the overall soundtrack is great, just the themes from this game's multiple menus, they are such an earworm to me that I can't help but love them. It's a little hilarious how some of my favourite tracks are just in the game's menu screens. So I'll circle back around to the music later, but for now on, let's talk about the World Tour Story Mode. I freaking love this mode, still do, but man, every time I go and play it, I still get lost in it and I'm just like, I still can't believe this is in a fighting game. This right here is a good refreshing take on how fighting game story modes are done. Rather than a traditional chapter system like we've seen in previous fighting games, with this one, it is a open world, semi open world, sandbox style story mode where you travel around and you get into fights with people or you can train with other people like not just characters on the roster but also characters that have been involved in not just Street Fighter's history but Capcom's history. This entire world tour story mode not only tells a pretty good narrative that's very straightforward but it's also a good way to include a lot of love and easter eggs from the overall history that Capcom has been making video games and it is absolutely massive how many things are in here. You can even go around and you can look for arcade machines of classic video games and you can unlock them and play them later outside the world tour mode and they even rotate around in the battle hub so you can go on the leaderboards and whatnot. Oh, and speaking of which, the Battle Hub was an ingenious idea as well. You can just go in there and you can just mess around with your avatar character in the unique avatar battles. I don't do that very often, but it's a very cool thing to have. And if you've watched a lot of videos on Maximilian's channel where he played a bit of Street Fighter 6, 
One of the things that he loved doing was hosting lobbies to just invite people to muck around with their avatar characters, and that's hilarious. And I love the way how it's presented that each one of these is like a game within a game. When you first get this game and you put it on your PS4 or your PS5, depending on which version you purchased, you have the option to download or not download the Fighting Grounds or the World Tour. You can have those separate if you want to install those later to save up a bit of memory. But I installed all of them and even when I was running out of space on my PS5, I did not want to uninstall those. Luckily, I found myself a big, big, huge storage card that I put into my PS5 that's two terabytes, so I could just have everything installed. Which is awesome because I love going back and replaying these modes. World Tour, it's fantastic. And I also love how in World Tour, you can just talk to a lot of the legacy characters and the new characters as you are learning from them and you learn more about them or you relearn some things you may not have remembered which is also cool to anyone who loves these characters and then you've got fighting grounds which has your traditional arcade mode your practice mode you've got your team battle mode and you've got the extra battle mode which is a whole different beast entirely i always get my ass kicked in this mode even by the game's ai it is absolutely wild the amount of stuff you have in this game on top of the fact that these characters have amazing designs one of my favorite all-time characters was dj despite the fact that he was considered garbage tier in street fighter 4 i still played him a lot and his new design and his whole character in this game i love it i just can't help but get entranced by a lot of his animations where he's just dancing around and then you've got uh yeah Whew. yeah to say this game looks amazing would be underselling it so yeah this game has a lot of great content and it shows now we've got that out of the way let's circle back around to the music because i do want to talk about the character specific themes in this game mainly because they were a bit divisive amongst fans when people first heard them because it was a pretty different take for quite a lot of characters. I myself personally find myself enjoying the large majority of character themes in this game, with Zangief's being my personal favourite. I also love Ed's theme in this game. Very similar to Street Fighter V, he has a lyrical song, but unlike Street Fighter V, this one has the entire track completely done in German rap, which I never thought I'd like, but geez, I sure do now. Special honourable mention to Kimberly's level 3 music, especially in a mirror match, where not only do you get a nice catchy tune, but also some nice catchy lyrics.
and the rollback netcode is great. I forgot to mention this in the Tekken 8 segment, but yes, that game has great rollback, and thankfully, this game, Street Fighter 6, also has great rollback. And because I don't know how to make a segue, I'll just go straight into saying that, thankfully, Mortal Kombat 1 also has good rollback, so yay! As I said earlier, waiting for the fixes in Mortal Kombat 1 is quite a long and tedious process, but thankfully, at the time of this recording, a lot of the issues with online have been resolved. These syncs are a lot less frequent, I have not encountered one since I recently played, and the crossplay also works really good too. I had a lot of games against mostly people on PlayStation because I play Mortal Kombat 1 on Steam. By the way, apologies in advance for the quality of my clips fluctuating between 1440p and 1080p. Getting my clips from my PC onto my PS5 was quite the son of a nugget. But uh, anyway, let's talk about the positives with this game's online. And I'm happy to report, there's quite a bit. Getting matches between PlayStation 5 and Xbox, they work out really damn well. Unfortunately, there is still no crossplay for the people who went out of their way to buy the Nintendo Switch version. Why does that exist again? <coughs> Sorry, I got off track there. Uh, now, there is still an issue where you are just looking at a screen that just says searching for match, and there are times where you can be waiting there for three to five minutes. Now, I'm not going to knock the game for that in that aspect, because a lot of games have that issue where you're just waiting ages for a match. What I will knock at points for is the fact there's nothing else you can do. With Street Fighter 6 VI and Tekken 8, and even the games that came before, Street Fighter 5 and Tekken 7, you could go into a practice mode where you could just practice combos with your character and whatnot, look at the frame data. You could not do that with Mortal Kombat 1, and you also could not do that with MK11 or MKX. The only thing you can do, regardless of whether it's quick match or the combat league rank matches, is just stare at a screen that says searching for match. And you could be staring at it for quite some time, and the fact that you can't do anything about it other than wait or just back out and then go back into it in the hopes it'll find someone faster, yeah, that's a bit of a problem. I mean, it's quite tedious, and there have been times where I've just been stuck there and I'm just like... <sighs> yeah, it's not fun. It ain't fun. But thankfully, when you get into the game, it is fun. And I will say this because uh, this is pretty much similar to the impressions I had with the beta. While presentation-wise, I feel that it's uh, quite disappointing. Just getting into matches and the way the feel of the game is, it's good because once you start getting into matches online and you're able to get things going with your character, that's a good feeling. I like that a lot. My personal favorite is of course Baraka and Jax. And as I said in the beta, I like playing Jax as my main cameo because even though he's not the most viable for quite a few characters, it's just a simple fact that I like Jax, he's always been a classic favourite of mine. Not to mention, he smokes cigars, I smoke cigars. So it's a rule of mine where if there's a character that has a stogie, I gotta play that character. And with a team as awkward as mine, it really is forcing me to use the ins and outs on every mechanic in this game. And that's a good thing because in the beta, I had my issues with things like up block and whatnot. But up block in this game, uh, my opinions on that have changed. It's quite a good, unique mechanic once you wrap your head around it. And then you've got things like where you cancel into a jump after doing a counter hit uppercut. I still have no use for that, but I've seen some people online find a good use for it, getting some very situational combos. So yeah, there's quite a lot to this game in the gameplay department. And while there are still some things that need ironing out, the overall game feel, it's okay. Uh, that's the best way I can describe it, it's okay. There's definitely a game here to be played, and it is quite fun when you get going, as I said. Though me personally, I will still prefer MKX's gameplay over it. 
Now, it may sound like I'm dragging out the gameplay and the online a little bit. And to be honest, that's because I am. Because this game's offline offerings, woof. So, I'm pretty sure at this point in time, all of you listening to this are familiar with the story mode and how it's played out. I had a lot of dumb fun with the story mode. Thankfully, like all the story modes that have come before, they are very well presented and very well acted, with one exception. We don't talk about that. But, of course, there are some issues that people have with the ending. And I had a lot of fun with it, despite its obvious issues. But my main issue with the story is that it's a lot of the same. Like I said earlier, with the way this game is presented, how it feels it's fulfilling a status quo, that is unfortunately a same feeling I have with the overall story. Because of its chapter system, which has been the exact same since frickin' MK versus DC, MK9, Injustice, MKX, Injustice 2, MK11, and now MK1, yeah, this very formulaic approach, which seems to be perfect on paper, but in execution, has been a massive dent in this franchise and its characters. Like, for example, the final boss fight. It is very anticlimactic, and this, the funny thing is, is that when you fight the exact same boss in arcade mode, it has a better climax. It's quite hilarious. And not to mention, the climax is brought down by the fact that it does the whole multiverse thing. Where you don't play as a character that you've been following in the story. Instead, another version of that character comes right the fuck out of nowhere. And I will say, it is a nice way they did it. How it lets you choose whoever you want for the finale. But as I said, you're choosing an alternate version of that character that is completely separate from the whole ass story that you've been playing. And yeah, it, it's, it, it's weird. It's weird. Not to mention, as I said, very anticlimactic. Take a look. This is the story mode. To survive, you must submit. Yes. The question you must ask is, if Liu Kang couldn't finish us, how possibly could you fight? And they called me the Chosen One. The tribe will feast on this praise. It's time to finish this. You have done more than enough. Please permit me to end this. May that be the last we see of you. And this is the arcade. Full disclosure, I don't believe in magic. Magic doesn't care what you believe. <laughs> Suck on that! Round one, fight! Torpedo! More field! Torpedo!
That was so much better than story mode, it's insulting. And I don't get why they do that. I mean, seriously, look at the boss fight in Street Fighter 6. And do I even need to talk about Tekken 8? Everybody and their mothers, fathers, sisters, grandmothers have already talked about how epic that final boss fight is. I mean, hell, it would be unfair to compare that to Mortal Kombat. So instead I'll use Tekken 7. Yeah, I think you get the point. And outside of that, you are left with customization, more on that later, and your classic arcade towers mode. Unfortunately, this game's main mode, which was invasions, that requires you to be online all the time. So good luck playing this mode if you have a shit internet connection or no internet at all. The only reason you will find yourself playing this is if you really want to grind for those special seasonal skins for your characters, or if you enjoy playing the Test Your Mind minigame. Outside of that, Invasions mode is a frickin' chore. And playing a video game should never have to feel like a frickin' chore, especially if it's a fighting game. Now, some people feel differently about this, but me, the way I feel, ugh. Just going back and replaying Invasions mode for the purpose of this video? Uh, man, the things I have to do for content. It was not enjoyable, and that's putting it very politely. But, people who don't like this mode, they go through it anyway because they really want those special skins for their characters. The way this works is that each season has a different type of story where you have to 
fight the ultimate end boss, which is just one of the characters from the roster, but it's a super version of that character, and you unlock a special skin for them. I've only ever done that once, and that was at the very first season, Season of Fire, which I thought I wouldn't even get to play, but that got extended, even though I got the game a month later after it came out, because I received this game as a gift, and I still was able to get into that season and then play and get the skin for the final boss of that season, which was Hellfire Scorpion. And even before I unlocked it in Invasions mode, I already unlocked it, but with a different color palette by just playing Combat League. I didn't even try to get it. And that there is a bit of a problem, because people, while they will like to grind for that costume, the main reason they want to grind Invasions mode is to get everything for their specific character by getting them to a high enough level. And the reason why it's an issue is because even now at this point in time it is so bad that the developers actually had to make the grind less tedious. They've been updating the game so that it's less strenuous, but it's still freaking strenuous. They even had to add in a button to make your character run faster on this little freaking board game style map. And the fact they even needed to do that, yeah, you, you can see why this mode's an issue, right? And on top of all of that, it's an online only mode. This type of mode should not be online only. Especially if you just want to earn things for your characters. Alright, I mean, say what you will about Street Fighter 6 and with its microtransactions, more on that later, but at least you could earn your alternate character costumes offline in world tour mode. And you could also do the same thing in Tekken 8 where you can earn your fight gold for the character customization. But for this game, if you want to earn anything, even if you're not playing Invasions, you have to be online all the damn time. And that's one of the biggest things holding this franchise back right now. This was the issue of MK11 and it's an issue of MK1. This whole freaking live service model. And that's only part of the issue. Now let's talk about the customization. It's already bad enough that the customization in this game is frickin' lacking. I can't believe I did this, but yesterday, I was able to get me a very dirt cheap copy of MK11. And I still had my save data that I had uploaded to my cloud storage, so I could just re-download that and get all my customizations, and I was quite astonished at how significantly better it was in MK11. And the funny thing is that in MK11 it still sucked. It did. But it's way better than MK1 and yet for some reason the developers took a look at this and said, yeah that's good, but it's not good. And what makes it even worse is that the skins you have for the characters that you can unlock in game, they are either meh or what the fuck. And when I mean what the fuck, I mean what the fuck. Especially with this current season of the Huntress, which was actually meant to be the season of chaos, but then they reworked it into saying that nope, this is the Melina season, she just got help from Havoc, which is why everybody has fucking ugly costumes. Now, I could make a joke about how terrible these costumes are, but YouTube already did that for me. By the Elder Gods, what is this abomination? Honestly, I don't know why I was even created either. You look like a terminally ill punk rock cancer patient. Couldn't have said that any better. What were the NRS developers thinking? At this point, nothing about this surprises me. That last line hurts so much because of how true it is. The Mortal Kombat fans aren't even surprised at how bad things have gotten. And... That sucks. The level of complacency is frickin' sad to see. Where it's just expected that things are gonna be either mediocre or it's just...
just plain bad. And it really does suck to see it, you know, end up like this. And it's not just with these seasonal costumes either. Even with the alternate palettes that are available for some of the premium skins, a lot of them are references to the classic era, and a lot of them don't make sense, especially with a lot of Scorpion's costumes. And it's... <sighs> yeah, I'm just... I'll just be dragging this on at this point. So basically, this game's offerings, it is very, very minimal. It's honestly quite amazing in a very bad way, just how little there is to this game. And, and uh, I'm trying my best here, I really am. As I said before, there is a lot of game here to be enjoyed from a gameplay perspective. But everything else around it, the weird decisions of a lot of its characters, the weird decisions of its costumes, and of course, the microtransactions. Now, say what you will, whether it's Warner Brothers fault or NetherRealm's fault, the reason why this is such an issue is because now we're getting into a stage where a lot of other fighting games are doing this a lot better. Now, let's bring Tekken 8 back into the conversation. This game did not launch with a type of in-game shop, but after its release, it received one, and it's actually very well implemented. Many of the premium skins in Mortal Kombat they have ridiculous price tags on them. Now, the actual pricing of the costumes shouldn't really be an issue, but with Mortal Kombat, there are two issues. Not only is the price of the costumes ridiculous, but actually getting the amount of currency you want for a costume you really want to get your hands on is also really stupid. This is something that Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter VI have in common with Street Fighter's Fighter Coins and with Mortal Kombat's Dragon Crystals. The way these are displayed for you, the prices that you have to purchase them, the lowest amount wasn't even enough to get you one single costume. So that encourages overspending. Now what's even more ridiculous about this in the case of Mortal Kombat, with Street Fighter, it's just costumes. But with Mortal Kombat, the character voice announcer packs, they are more expensive than actual characters that you can play. And this is also the same for premium costumes. The premium costumes in this game, such as Deception Lee Mei, which was redesigned, so it's not actually Deception Lee Mei, and as well as Natara's costume, all of that, uh, Sub-Zero, Scorpion, all of these premium costumes, they are ten dollars maybe even more depending on where you are there are a thousand dragon crystals so in my region that's about twelve dollars for a costume and the more recent ones that have come out they are six dollars because they obviously saw the backlash for the previous prices and they brought that down oh and also while you still have easy fatality tokens what's even more ridiculous is paying for fatalities that is fucking stupid and now we're going to talk about Tekken 8 because the way the shop was implemented in this game it's actually really good really really good all right so the lowest amount of Tekken coins you can buy is 500 and that's about five dollars or in my currency it is seven dollars 95 cents that is the exact same amount for 500 Dragon Crystals in Mortal Kombat 1. But, here's the kicker. Like I said, in Mortal Kombat, $10 a costume. The lowest amount for a costume, $6. Alright, with the Sub-Zero costume that is out right now, as well as the MK3 Smoke and Scorpion, they're $6. For Tekken 8... Their costumes cost four dollars, four hundred Tekken tokens, which means 
Not only will you have enough for the costume you want, but you've still got a hundred coins left over for anything else you want. Which is why you have the option to save it up or you can spend it on avatar customizations. Oh yeah, and when they did implement the shop, they also put in a Tekken 30 year anniversary pack where you could download t-shirts with the Tekken slogan and whatnot for free. And not only that, but the costumes that are on sale in the Tekken shop, they are good recreations of these classic skins. And they even have extra details, like the bangles on Ling Xiao Yu's Tekken 4 costume. It turns out the one on the right hand, that's a watch. You can actually see the little hand and how it's meant to look like it's telling the time. And not only that, not only that, when you buy these costumes, you can customize them almost however you like. I bought Kazuya's Tekken 6 costume from the story mode, which was scenario campaign, and I recolored it to make it my own different take on the Army of Two. Remember that game? And... Ah, oh man, I, 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 I just don't know what to say. And do you want to know the worst part? Do you want to know the worst part? The fact that this video is almost an hour? I haven't even covered my pet peeves with Mortal Kombat yet. Because believe me, there is one that has been bugging me so freaking much. But you know what? I'm going to talk about it in a second part. That's right, there's going to be a part two to this video. Alright, and I'm going to be covering a lot of my pet peeves there. And I'm going to talk about how other fighting games have done it better. So, if you were able to stick around for this long, thank you very much. And I hope you also stay tuned. Did I just say stay tuned? Jeez, look what you're doing to me, Mortal Kombat. Make sure to stay tuned for part two to this topic about the big three. But until then, I'll see you later, Fano. So next up on part two, we've got... <laughs>